So, you know, I think if everybody has been paying attention to what case counts have looked like here in Niagara, we're on a, you know, a five day run, I will say. You haven't seen today's numbers yet, but we're on a fifth day today. You'll see we are under 20 cases again. So things definitely look a little bit better. And likewise, the provincial numbers have been quite good as well. If we take a look at the provincial trend in cases, you can see there's really a clear emerging trend of a slow, gentle downward slope in terms of our cases. And likewise in Niagara, it's a little bit noisier because we're a smaller sample size, but you can see that that downwards trend does seem to be appearing here with maybe a little bit of a blip that occurred in September, but definitely we seem to be headed in the right direction right now. I think that's a similar trend that if we look across many different regions nearby us and of similar size to us across the province, there definitely does seem to be this slight downwards trend. Uh, one thing you will notice, though, is that we have been a little slower to come to this downward trend where actually everybody, you know, as of October 7th, which is the latest data I have from the province, everybody else had actually dipped a bit below us. But over the last few days, I think we've seen our cases come down. So I think we'll be joining them in the next little while. Just one other thing I just want to highlight here is the dotted line here, which is Hamilton, which was a regional hotspot for a while. I really do think whenever we've seen cases go up in Hamilton, they tend to come up in Niagara. And that was partly what drove our increase. And it's really interesting to see the pattern here where it came down, flattened, went up a bit before coming down. That's really mirrored here in terms of our cases. And I think it really speaks to how much what happens across your border can really influence what happens with your cases locally. Uh, those are what's happening with our cases. If we take a look at our hospitalizations, I think they are mirroring some of those same trends. So provincially, hospitalizations are showing that small, uh, gentle decline, uh, mirroring that there are fewer cases to be hospitalized. And likewise, with IC admissions, they are very slowly declining as well, reflecting that there's fewer people who are getting sick with COVID-19, and so fewer people will be having severe illness with COVID-19. In Niagara, it's a bit noisier data. It probably looks a little bit more flat here, both for uh, hospitalizations and ICU admissions. And I think that's just because it's actually a relatively small number. It's hard to really make out too much of a pattern there. But definitely, we're not seeing any kind of increase similar to maybe what we saw in our third wave. And you know, if you saw the Ontario Science Tables projections, you know. We have, at the time they showed we had flattened out and we're predicting one if, you know, we would be in a range somewhere between here where we could see a gentle decline, which is the green trajectory. If we stayed status quo, we'd keep flat and eventually start to go up versus a trajectory where we maybe started to increase more quickly. And a lot of that would really depend on how much increased contact there was, particularly in return to school and workplaces and what happens in terms of uh, what people do as they get deeper into the fall and to cooler weather. I think if you're looking where we are in Ontario, where we have, you know, reporting three to 500 cases, we do seem to be tracking much more closely to that green line right now, which is, I think, really encouraging. That being said, I do think as we get closer into the fall, uh, deeper into the fall in the weather cools, we're gonna to start to see that movement of people indoors, which is gonna make it difficult to continue that downwards trend. And likewise, with um, the Thanksgiving weekend we just had, I'm sure there was lots of uh, social gatherings. Hopefully most of the social gatherings are amongst vaccinated people, which would be relatively low risk, but I'm sure some of the unvaccinated people as well had social gatherings and we may see a bump in cases really tied to that group. And so I'm not optimistic that we will see this downward trajectory continue all the way to November. And I do think we'll see at least some kind of blip due to Thanksgiving in here. And whether it's just a blip or whether it actually starts to lead to an increase, I think will be seen. Certainly hope, of course, it is gonna be closer to a blip. I think you know this is all very encouraging news, very different than what we were thinking would happen a month ago where we were seeing you know, cases going up quite sharply. I think what we want to do is try and make sure that we continue this downward trajectory as much as possible. We're now about three weeks out from the province's vaccine certification requirements, and I think that's really helping, and that may be one of the reasons why we've seen Niagara's cases dip under the 20 cases per day for five days straight. I think we're starting to really see the impact of that vaccine certification and helping keep our cases low. 
other things that I want to really pay attention to is the mobility of people. And because we know that mobility really tends to reflect how much people are out and about interacting socially with others, creating that opportunity for infection to spread. And this is the mobility data put out by the province where it's looking like it's been pretty flat since things moved uh, into step three in the summer. And so that's encouraging. We're not really seeing an increase there. Things are staying flat. So things are gonna be becoming more difficult for us to manage. If we actually look at the breakdown of what's happened, you know, people staying home is staying pretty flat. Being out in retail and recreation is pretty flat. There is an interesting dip here of people going to parks, people walking, that's probably in part a reflection of end of summer and people are going back to work and school, as well as the weather's maybe not quite as nice. And so people aren't maybe in partaking in those activities as much, but it hasn't really reflected too much into a massive increase in people using transit. There's been a little bit of an increase, but not massive, nor in terms of more people being out and about doing retail and recreation rather than relaxing in parks or taking walks. If we look at mobility here in Niagara, I think it's pretty similar. You know, we are seeing it uh, as compared to the rest of the pandemic an all time low in people staying home, but that seeming needs to stay pretty flat right now. And there might've been even a touch increase in people staying home of late. So that's definitely not, you know, creating conditions where we're gonna see more spread, which is good. And likewise, when we look at shopping and recreation, you know, with step three, we definitely saw people out and about shopping, recreating much more than they had at any point previously in the pandemic. It's declined a little bit as we've gone into September and people have returned to work and school, but it's not going up. And I think that's really good news. So I think the, as far as the mobility trends are positive and I think give us some confidence that we might be able to prolong keeping cases under control going into the fall. The other area where I'm very focused on is on schools. And schools are, of course, uh, an area where you have a congregation of a lot of people who are not going to be vaccinated because many students aren't eligible for vaccination. And the older students are one of the age groups that has the lower vaccination uptake. So you have a congregation of unvaccinated people, students, children, of course, are gonna socially interact. That's gonna create opportunities for infection. And that's gonna be an area where we wanna definitely try and keep cases under control. Both so we keep cases under control throughout the uh, community. We don't have children spreading infection then onto vulnerable seniors and adults and other family members, but also because we wanna try and make sure kids actually get a proper school year this year and don't have schools shut down again to control the pandemic. If we take a look at what are some of the trends in terms of age and, and cases, this was data put out by the Ontario Science Table of what the Ontario data is showing. And if you look at this five to 11 age group, that's of course a school age group who is under the 12 year old where they can get vaccinated. So this is that highest risk group of students who is unvaccinated, not yet eligible to be vaccinated. And you can see that in the province, there's been this trend upwards in terms of cases in that age group to where they're actually now one of the leading, uh, they are the leading age group in terms of young people's cases. If we take a look here at some data put out in England. It's actually pretty similar here. You can see the seven to 11 year age group, again, school year age group who is too young to be vaccinated. You're seeing this increase in cases, which you're not really seeing across their other age groups. And so this is you know, very much playing out exactly what I've been concerned about that if a younger school age group who can't be vaccinated, who's back in school interacting with each other is going to create a scenario where you could see cases start to go up. So let's take a look at what's happening in Niagara and are we reflecting the Ontario trend and the trend that we're seeing in the UK? And it's interesting here. So this is that under 20 age group that's you know uh, school age children. You can see things have gone up a bit, but actually have pretty steady, pretty stayed pretty flat from there. And if we start to draw in our other age groups, you can actually see that that school age group, you know, not as good as the older age groups who have a higher vaccination uptake, but they're not doing bad compared to that 20 to 30 year age group. We're definitely not seeing that divergence where they are rising more quickly. Let's take a deeper dive then into the, you know, under 35 age group to really understand these groups, which are a little bit higher than the rest and what's actually happening in them. And so I've broken this down into an age four or five, which might be in kindergarten, age six to 11, which would be 
in elementary schools and not able to be vaccinated. Age 12 to 17 are school age children who can be vaccinated. And then your early uh, uh, people, uh, young adults who are out of school, possibly moved out, might be in university, and then a couple other you know, segments of that age group. We take a look here, you know, this is our under age four and you can see them drawing in here. And we're particularly focused on that gray level, uh, group, which is the school age children who can't be vaccinated. And you can see here that gray group is actually really very much within the pack. We're not seeing that six to 11 age group diverging the way it is in the rest of the province where we're seeing more spread in that age group. We're seeing actually the highest risk is within the 18 to 24 age group, which is actually consistent throughout the pandemic been the group where we've seen the uh, most spread of infection. And actually that age group is of course also the group where we see the lowest vaccine uptake, which maybe partly explains why they haven't seen their cases come down as much. But I think the important story here is that thus far, we are not seeing the pattern in the rest of the province playing out here. We are seeing our school age children who are in school, not yet able to be vaccinated at the highest risk of getting infection spreading amongst them. And we're not seeing particularly higher rates of infection in them. And so I think that's really good news. And I think that speaks to a lot of what we are doing in schools in Niagara is very much working. I know in public health, we have put our top priority to make sure we keep schools safe. That means school age children get priority for follow up in terms of cases. So we get to them right away. When we have infections in the school, we are actually sending people out to that school to do an inspection to make sure we have all the right proactive measures in place. Before the school year started, we actually did proactive visits to every single school we could get to, to make sure they had all of the right prevention precautions in place. And in some cases, slightly improved precautions to what the province required. And thus far, I think that is really playing out that we are successfully keeping our schools safe. If we take a look at what we have seen in schools, so, you know, it doesn't mean that there's been zero cases. We've had 150 cases that are in some way linked to school. Linked to school doesn't mean that they got infection from school. It could mean they got it from school. It could also mean they got it outside of school and showed up to a school, but somehow 150 people who've attended school at some point have unfortunately had COVID-19 since schools reopened on September 7th. That accounts to about 15% of our total cases in Niagara during that time period. Obviously when you have a case who's in a school, they can potentially infect a large number of other people. And we've had quite a large number of contacts to those cases. It's actually, you know, 2,338 other people have been exposed by these 150 people in schools. And so that's a substantial number of people affected in schools. A lot of students, a lot of staff, particularly when they're unvaccinated, who've actually had their schooling disruptive, who had to isolate for up to 10 days to make sure that they're not uh, developing infection and spreading onwards. Isolating all those people has meant that we're able to see the pattern we saw in the previous slide where we're not seeing at school age cases go up. We're successfully, I think, suppressing the spread of infections, but it is coming at a real disruption to a lot of learning for students and disruption to have even some staff who may have to isolate and are not able to be in the school to be teaching. There are 65 schools that have been impacted by these 150 cases, so a substantial number of schools. It's almost, you know, uh, getting close to almost a third of the schools we have here in Niagara. And we've had 11 school outbreaks. And so these are 11 instances where at least some spread has occurred within the school. Fortunately, these outbreaks have largely been small. I think almost all of these outbreaks have been fewer than five cases. So we've definitely been successful at containing spread. We're not seeing whole classes get infected. But again, that's because there's been a lot of very rapid isolation of people. And unfortunately, that's meant a lot of disruption to learning. If we take a look at the pattern of where these cases are coming, you can see overwhelmingly our cases are in elementary school. And again, you know, that makes sense. That's where we have the six to 11 year old population who can't be vaccinated. They're at greatest risk. And we absolutely see that playing out that they are where we are seeing the most cases. If we're looking at contacts, likewise, you know, most contacts are in elementary school. And again, that I think reflects that there's the most cases there. And if we look at the role of uh, the person who is a contact, you can see that overwhelmingly it is students. Staff, of course, are a significant number, and then there's a few other people who may have visited or happened to be in school at the time. Uh, makes sense, of course, that students are often going to be the contacts because in a classroom, 
you may have 20, 25 students, but only one staff person. Uh, and so that's going to mean students are going to be the ones who get most affected by the disruption when there is an infection in school. When we look at the source of where these infections are coming from, you know, the setting where people are getting infected, overwhelmingly almost half of the infections are happening in the home, a few more in uh, the home of someone they may have visited, and then places like family gatherings, other social gatherings, going to parties, sports and recreation, other sources. About a quarter of the spread is occurring actually in school or in uh, childcare that they may be attending after school. But the biggest risk factor for students or staff getting sick with COVID-19 is that someone else in the home brings infection in and that's where they get affected. And I think this is particularly important for parents who may have children in school. They absolutely want to be vaccinated because they don't want to be the source of causing infection to their child. And of course, then having all of their child's friends get affected because they expose them when they head to school. Looking at that same data another way, you know, the person they actually received infection from usually is the household and makes sense when the transmission is in the home. Friends are of another source, family members who might be visiting are another source. And then again, about a quarter happened in school or childcare where they happen to be uh, and where the infection is spreading. I also want to just quickly note that there has been some uh, infection from international travel. And of course, as you know, this means that a case uh, was infected by international travel, they showed up to a school and then potentially put other people at risk. So biggest message here, I think, is that to protect our students in that six to 11 range, the most important thing we can be doing right now is to make sure everybody else in the household is vaccinated and their friends, their family outside of the home also get vaccinated to make sure that everybody the child interacts with is vaccinated and that by that measure, they're gonna be protected so they're not bringing infection to the school. They're not seeing their learning disrupted because they have to isolate. If we take a look at our vaccination uptake data in Niagara, these are first doses. And then these here would be second doses. We can see we continue to you know, drive the numbers up slowly. We're up to 86% in the province has set a 90% target for both first and second doses. So we are hopefully be able to maybe get to even to that 90% sometime this month. Uh, you can see the big gap though right now with vaccinations is in the under 30 age group. You know, children who are in uh, the later years of elementary and secondary school do have more opportunity to get vaccinated, particularly this, you know, 7% or so of people, 7.5% who have one dose but not yet the second dose will hopefully be able to close that gap in the next little while. A lot of these first doses have been relatively recent, so that gives me hope that they're just waiting for their opportunity to come back for that second dose. In this 18 to 29 age group, you can imagine that some of the people at the later part of that age group could well be parents of some of the youngest children who are not yet eligible for vaccination. And then in the 30 to 39 age group, again, you know, the second dose numbers aren't quite as high as maybe some of our older age groups. And again, those could be a lot of the parents to some of these children who are being affected in school. And so a real priority that we want to get these vaccination rates up so we can have the parents vaccinated and make sure that we keep children safe. Now, one thing the province announced a couple of weeks ago was their new testing pilot around rapid testing. And there's been a few questions around how we plan to use that here in Niagara. And that's something I think we're still studying to figure out. And we're actually working with all of our medical officer of health and public health colleagues across the province to really figure out what is the right use case for that testing. But I just want to just demonstrate what some of the challenges around doing that testing are. So the rapid test that we have in Ontario primarily is a test that's a brand name PanBio. And this is a study that was published recently looking at how effective that PanBio testing is and how accurate it is. And if you take a look at you know, children who are symptomatic, it picks about 73% of infections. So that's not as good as our PCR test, which is well over 95% approaching 100%. But you know, you know, for a test that you get back in 15 minutes, that you know, definitely gives you some benefit. This is for symptomatic children. And you can see the accuracy is optimal two days after symptom onset. Now, if someone develops symptoms of COVID-19, as you know, we recommend that those people isolate and go get a PCR test. 
So for the most part, we're not too concerned necessarily about symptomatic children being in school because they really should be isolated already. And we absolutely aren't really going to rely on a rapid test on two days after they've developed symptoms before they're going to find out that they might have COVID-19 and they should stay home and isolate. That really should be happening the moment people develop symptoms. So, you know, th this isn't necessarily as useful to us in terms of what we want to do to keep school students safe. What we'd ideally want is a way to detect infections before there are symptoms so we can detect infections earlier and keep those uh, people out of school, protecting the rest of those who are in school. As well, for those sim uh, cases who are asymptomatic, who don't develop any symptoms, we want a way to identify them so we can keep them out of school from infecting others because we don't have the benefit of symptoms to identify those two groups. When we look at asymptomatic children, unfortunately, the test is a lot less accurate. It only picks about 43% of infections. The other thing I want to highlight here is that this study was done in a clinical setting. So we had healthcare providers doing this testing. And the Ontario pilot is not for a healthcare provider to do the swabs for the testing. It's actually for people to take home the test and the parent to do the test on the child. And so that is probably going to mean you're not going to get as good results because they're not going to have the training and skill of a healthcare provider. So it probably would be even lower than this. Now, you know, that's still better than zero. We're still going to pick up some infections that could be asymptomatic, but it does, I think, right away, you can see weaken the potential benefit of using that uh, rapid testing amongst asymptomatic children in hopes of identifying infections early. I just want to show how this then plays out in terms of what would be the real world impact of it. So, you know, let's uh, make some assumptions here to define a scenario. Let's say we've got a school of about 500 students. We have, let's say, you know, I showed 43% uh, ability to detect infections and it'll probably be lower if parents are doing it. Let's just make the math easy. Let's say it's 50% effect. That's probably better than we're going to get, but let's just use it for the sake of argument. Now, rapid tests are very good at detecting if someone is disease-free. They're you know, very good, so we'll give them a very good rating there. It's almost 99% that if someone doesn't have an infection, it's going to come back showing that they have a negative test. We're not going to get very many false positives. Uh, prior to this past week, so going through September, we were seeing about 50 symptomatic cases per 100,000 population in the 6 to 11 age group. That number fell last week, uh, I think, in reflecting maybe our cases coming down. But let's say we're at that worst scenario in the part of September where cases are a little higher. These are symptomatic cases. These are the ones we know about that we've detected. What about the asymptomatic cases? Research tends to show maybe 30% of cases are asymptomatic. So that might be maybe another 25 asymptomatic cases per 100,000. Let's just be really generous here and say we're doing a terrible job and there's almost as many asymptomatic cases as symptomatic cases and we're missing those right now. And that's what we're hoping the rapid test is gonna be able to help us figure out. And to make sure we pick up cases effectively, we'll do rapid testing three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'll do a round of testing, three rounds of testing to make sure we don't end up missing any cases by having big gaps between that testing. So this is the scenario we'll maybe say we're gonna apply this. So out of these 500 students, what will we hope to get with rapid testing? So every four weeks, rapid testing is gonna pick up one symptomatic case. Now, of course, a symptomatic case, as soon as someone has symptoms, they should be staying home, isolating, not being in school. So the rapid test isn't really gonna help us with that. Ideally, this person is already at home. So it's not really a benefit when it comes to that. When it comes to asymptomatic cases, we're gonna pick up that one asymptomatic case every eight weeks. So you're doing three rounds of testing every week for eight weeks, that's 20, uh, uh, 24, uh, sorry, 32 rounds of testing. Sorry, 24 rounds of testing, and you're gonna pick up one asymptomatic case. So not a lot of pickup, we're doing 24 tests, uh, rounds of testing on all those children. And, if we look at our false positives, you know, pretty low false positive rate, but you're testing 500 students three times a week, you're gonna pick up maybe 15 false positives every week. And so you can see that, you know, we'll get one undetected case every eight weeks, but at the cost of 15 false positives per week. So that's gonna be 120 false positives every eight weeks for picking up one asymptomatic case. And so this is the challenge we see with the rapid testing that just because it's not that accurate, because you do have false positives, 
when cases aren't very high, which is fortunately the situation we're dealing with right now, you end up with a lot more false positives than you're going to get true positives. And of course, a false positive means that child now is worried they have COVID-19. They have to stay home. They have to isolate. They can't go to school. Their parents might have to stay home to take care of them. They're not going to be able to go to work. There's a lot of disruption for really not much benefit if you're only going to pick up one case every eight weeks that you might not have picked up. Now we'll change the assumptions here a little bit because this is assuming that we have relatively low cases in the community. Let's go to you know, increase that fivefold. This is now kind of similar to what we might see across the border in the US in terms of what their uh, level of infections are. 250 cases per 100,000. And we'll say that there's a lot of you know, asymptomatic cases likewise. Now when we do this, we actually see you know, out of 500 students, every week we'll pick up a little over one symptomatic case we're not too concerned about. But every couple of weeks, we'll maybe pick up a case or more asymptomatically that we might have missed. And we're now only going to have one false positive every couple of weeks. So now your ratio is actually slightly better, where it's one to one or actually slightly better than one to one in terms of actual cases you'll pick up versus false positives. And so what we're trying to do as public health is figure out we're not going to go to your average school, test everybody with rapid testing, and get what I have showed on the previous slide where we have massive numbers of false positives. That I don't think makes a lot of sense. But can we define a high risk subset of schools or high risk subset of students where now the risk is a lot higher and you actually end up with a better ratio of actual cases you're gonna pick up and not too many false positives. And I think that's what we're trying to figure out right now as a public health community across the province. And we haven't figured that out yet. We're still examining that. And part of what this use case might be is that you know, we would do that rapid testing only when cases are higher in our community, because that would, of course, increase your baseline risk. And then we find a pocket of even higher risk in terms of a school or in terms of a subpopulation where we're particularly concerned about. So that's where I think you will see us go with that rapid testing. We're likely not announcing anything anytime soon, and it's not going to be used on a wide scale. It's going to be used in very targeted situations where we see particularly high risk. Last comment I just want to make uh, before we turn over to questions is, of course, you know, the good news is that we're not seeing this level of cases in the community. We're having that number actually down to about 30 per 100,000 per week. Uh, lots of, I think, what we're doing, as I started off saying, is really working to keep our cases flat in the community right now. And I think if we look at the U.S. versus Canada, it really shows what the, you know, beyond just the health impact of those cases are, what it means for the community as a whole. And this was a headline in the US the other day where they're seeing people aren't returning to work as much anymore. And America's unemployed, according to this headline, are sending a message that they'll go back to work when they feel safe. And right now with COVID spreading very widely in the US, they're not feeling safe and willing to go back to work. And there's an alarming number of women here, according to this headline, who have stopped working again to deal with unstable school and childcare situations. And our work keeping, COVID under control is really to prevent this kind of situation. We want to make sure people have the confidence that there's not a lot of risk when they head out in the home and go to work. And we want to keep schools safe so that children can be reliably at school so parents don't have to stop working or staying home or have the disruption and are able to return to normal. And I think that's why it's really important we continue with all the precautions that we've currently been practicing in Niagara to keep COVID under control. And that leads to, you know, this is the headline that we're seeing in Canada where Unlike the US where they're seeing job growth sluggish, we are seeing massive job gains. We're seeing unemployment is at an all time high now in the pandemic and back to pre pandemic levels. We've got a lot of momentum going and we don't wanna blow that momentum by going the US route. And that means I think keeping control of COVID-19, continue on the path we're following to make sure we keep it under control so we can keep seeing our economy recover and our society recover as a whole. And I'll stop there and turn it over to questions. Thanks, Dr. Virgi, and Dolly was interested in your update this week. Um, so Paul, I have you up first for a question and I will unmute you, give me one sec. There you go. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Virgi, the, um, the data you uh, provided on the, uh, the schools, um, is it fair to say that that just reinforces the importance of uh, detailed uh, case tracing and 
keeping numbers to a manageable level so that public health doesn't get um, overwhelmed? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the key factor that's allowed us to keep schools safe this school year, and even back, you know, last fall where we managed to keep schools open for the good four months, and then briefly in the March-April period between the second and third waves, is cases were low enough that we were able to rapidly follow up with every case in the school. We we're able to figure out who is potentially at risk and isolate them. And that lim really limited spread in terms of our schools. You know, we've never had to go down the route of having to close an entire school because spread of infections just got out of control. We've always been able to keep up with those chains of transmission. I think if schools had stayed open during the second wave or third wave, that we would not have been able to do that. And we would have had hit points where we would just not be able to do proper follow-up of cases. And we'd have to just declare schools closed because we wouldn't be able to do effective contact tracing. And so as long as we can keep schools safe, you know, I think we're seeing the real benefits right now where we're not seeing much spread in schools. And that's because we're able to do that really rapid and detailed contact tracing to make sure we find every chain of infection and stop them. And a follow-up, Paul? Sure. I think uh, your number said that almost 50% of the cases that we're seeing in the younger kids, they're getting infected at home. Uh, and that correlates, I think, with the younger, um, younger aged parents, that group not being highly vaccinated. Uh, so I guess your message would be to these younger parents who have kids in school is um, protect your kids, get vaccinated. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, that if it's true, about 50% of the infections for that unvaccinated uh, student child group who's younger than 12 who can't be vaccinated yet, 50% of them are getting their infection from home and then bringing the infection to school. But that's actually even true for our older students, the 12 and up, both the group who's unvaccinated there and actually the two thirds of them who are now actually fully vaccinated. Even there, when they do get a breakthrough infection, that spread is overwhelmingly coming from their home. It's not coming from within the school or other settings. The highest risk environment for everybody is their home and the way you make your home safe is of course, for everybody who can be vaccinated in the home to get vaccinated. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Gord, you are up next. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> uh, Hamilton Public Health, I guess, is talking about uh, making public uh, like a school by school vaccination rates. Um, are, are you considering the same thing? We're not considering that at this time. Um, Partly, we need to actually get the school data on which students are in school to be able to even do that kind of analysis. But we'd really see that more as probably something that the school board should be announcing themselves rather than something that I think we would be doing. Um, wouldn't say it would never happen, but our thinking right now would be to defer to the school boards to release that data. And a follow-up, Gord? And I guess unrelated to that, uh, you'd mentioned the impact neighboring communities can have on Niagara's numbers. Uh, we know now the border is going to reopen next month. I know it's a few weeks away, but any any thoughts on that and what impact that might have? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at uh, Niagara's cases, we're about 20 cases per 100,000 per week right now. If you're looking at, say, uh, Erie County, it's about 180 per 100,000 per week, so about nine times higher than ours. If you're looking at Niagara County, it's on the order of, I think, 220 per 100,000 per week, so about 11 times higher than us. So there's much higher cases across the border. And I do worry that if now people in Niagara start to travel across the border, they're sadly gonna pick up infection in the US where there's a lot more infection going around, especially when masking rules and the like are much more lax in the US and they'll sadly be bringing infection back over. You know, I actually took a look that since early August, which is when the, uh, you know, a little after the federal government first started to loosen the travel rules, uh, we've seen about, I think it's 77 cases of infection, either directly or with the first order family member getting infected due to that travel. So almost a case a day during that period. If we actually just look at October, since October 1st, there's been 12 cases linked to travel. You know, so again, we're still keeping up with that case a day. And almost every one of these cases is a fully vaccinated person. And I'd say the majority of them are actually traveled to the United States. And so there is absolutely risk for people when they are traveling internationally and traveling to the US where there is much higher spread of cases that even being fully vaccinated with just so much infection around you, you're sadly going to be at risk of getting COVID-19. And I do worry that we're gonna see more of that 
uh, when travel does increase uh, with this relaxation of rules. Uh, I think it's definitely something we're going to be paying very close attention to and, you know, watching and seeing if there's anything we can do to mitigate. But I think once the borders open, people are, you know, I think starved from their opportunity to travel to the U.S. and they will likely travel and unfortunately we will see infections brought back. Hey, thanks, Gord. Um, Paul, do you have one more question you'd like to ask? Uh, Paul, you're muted. So uh, the bottom line with the rapid testing, um, if people think it's going to be some kind of magic or silver bullet, mm -hmm. your message is that if it's going to be used, it'll be used very, very um, strategically targeted, that it's just it's just not workable um, in the, the bigger picture. It's just not, you get too many false positives. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense in our current context for everybody to be getting rapid testing all the time. Uh, that could change if our case, cases go up massively in the community. But right now, I think it would be used in a very targeted way. Now, there is you know, more research going on on things like, say you had a case in a school, right now we would say all of those contacts need to be isolated maybe there's an opportunity that rather than isolating all those cases, you just actually get them rapidly tested every day. And if every day they test negative, they could maybe stay in school and you're not actually having as many students who have their education disrupted. There's some mixed data coming out of the US and the UK on that. In the UK, I think it seemed to be effective. In the US, it seemed to actually lead to more spread of infection in schools. But there's some of those creative, I think, opportunities to use it that are still being researched. And we may actually see something new come down the pipeline in the coming weeks or months where we actually do find a new use case. But right now, I think the appetite is, you know, we don't see the use case yet and don't want to set expectations that we're going to see a broad use of rabbit testing because I think the data doesn't support that right now. Okay, thank you. And Gord, one more question for you, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the, the data the province provides for the vaccination rates for long-term care homes, uh, the most recent I found is, I think, August 31st. Do you have any more up-to-date data on that on a home-by-home -home basis? I think we've received some uh, more up-to-date data than that, either in late September, early October. Um, I don't know if that data would be public. What I can say is that the vaccination rates did go up between August and September as more people signed up, but there's definitely, I think, lots of homes where you're seeing under 80%, even in some cases under 70% vaccine uptake. And I think that's not high enough. And I think that's why we saw the announcement the other week where the province is now no longer gonna give the opt out for a vaccination where you can get tested instead. And they're gonna require everybody to be vaccinated because I think they feel that there's too much risk with too many staff choosing not to be vaccinated. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks guys, thanks for coming this week, small group. Um, we'll see you again in about two weeks. And if you have any other follow-up questions, just email me this afternoon. Thanks.